Hundreds of this type of aircraft flew with the United States Air Force Tactical Air Command in various bombing and other related functions for over two decades of successful service. The model also served with the air forces of Taiwan and Pakistan, and in both cases, as with those of US service, saw combat with distinction. They were the last of a long line of bombers built by the Martin Company. When production of the B-57 was concluded, the company went out of the aircraft manufacturing business to concentrate on missile ring. While the B-57 fitted perfectly into a specific United States requirement, it was actually designed by the British and was the first overseas combat aircraft to be bought by the Air Force since the First World War. The reason for this was simple. It was a question of the mission parameters the new plane was to fill parameters that were first identified with other aircraft less than 10 years before. Amongst the antecedents of the B-57 was another high-speed twin-engine bomber from the Martin Company, the B-26. The B-26 was originally designed as a classic medium bomber to operate from fairly high levels, carrying a quite respectable bomb load, but with a shorter range than the B-24 Liberator or the B-17 Flying Fortress. But as the benefits and methods of tactical air power became more fully understood, the B-26 was also used at lower levels, against key points in enemy supply lines. As the Army Air Force developed its tactical use of air power, the planes, directed by controllers on the ground with the troops, became coordinated with the land forces as aerial artillery. This system developed relatively spontaneously, as heavy single-engined US fighters had devastated targets, often with an emphasis on communications. Perhaps the best compromise between the heavier B-26 and the single-engined fighters like the P-47 Thunderbolt was the Douglas Invader. This plane was designated as an attack aircraft, given the number A-26, in reflection of its combination of a bomber's substantial internal bomb load with the speed and flexibility approaching that of a fighter. The A-26 was a superb piece of flying technology. Its heavy forward firepower enabled it to strafe enemy positions with fighter-like concentration, while it retained capability in more conventional bomber duties. Coming late in World War II, it was rushed into production as the most suitable design for the rapidly developing tactical use of air power. The Air Force Command were now convinced of the importance of the tactical attack plane, disrupting the enemy's supplies and reinforcements by destroying road and rail transportation behind the front and harassing the enemy's attempts to regroup on the battlefield. As the war went on, the invaders flew from forward bases just behind the lines. of the bases to enemy territory, they were within striking distance of enemy fighters and needed their own aerial protection, provided by aircraft like the P-61 Black Widow, a sophisticated purpose-built night fighter. By war's end, the importance of tactical air power was fully accepted, and when the Air Force was given its autonomy, a separate command was formed with this in mind, the Tactical Air Command. Of course, in the post-war years, all interest in aircraft procurement and design focused upon jet propulsion and the potential for aircraft of greater speed. To a certain extent, 
This tended to blind the planners to the lessons of the war, and the division between fighters and bombers, which had existed in pre-war thinking, was reconstructed. There were single-engined fighters with ground attack capability, and there were medium bombers, like the four-engine North American B-45 coming online. But the B-45 had been designed for conventional use, to drop bombs from considerable height while in level flight. It had limited load and was to be used in large numbers to do any significant damage. redesignated the B-26. Despite its ability to fill the role, it was a World War II plane, doing business in the jet age. Together with the other World War II piston-engined planes, the B-26s filled the gap in Korea and provided the tactical attack needs, but at considerable price, reflecting their vulnerability. Clearly, there was a gaping hole in the planning. What was needed was the jet-powered equivalent of the A-26, and there had simply been no serious expectation or provision for this. There was one exception. The Martin Company were working on a project, the XB-51, which was a plane that was clearly designed for tactical use. The B-51 employed many innovations, not least of which was its three-engined format with two jets attached to the forward fuselage and a third buried in the rear of the plane just ahead of the fin. It also used fuselage-mounted tandem main wheels and outrigger supports. Another feature was the variable incidence of its drooped, 35-degree swept back wing. The wing could be adjusted to various positions for takeoff and flight. The outrigger wheels stabilized the plane for takeoff and landing. For the first time, powered air brakes were incorporated, and a drag parachute was used to slow landings. Epitomizing the advanced design thinking was the B-51's rotary bomb door, which allowed quick ejection of the bomb load while the plane was still flying at very high speed. In the late 1940s, the Martin XB-51 stood as the only contender for the role of filling the shortfall that Korea was to demonstrate. Powerful and highly advanced, the B-51 was clearly pitched somewhere between fighter and bomber. Using jet-assisted takeoff, the B-51 takes to the air in one of the hundreds of tests that were carried out with it in the early 1950s to try and iron out its limitations. It was by no means a perfect aircraft, and clearly, before it was successful, it would need more development. The designers had successfully identified the task for the plane, but failed to develop a concept that really did the job. needed than Korea allowed, and the Washington administration needed some option to the B-51, so reluctantly they were forced to consider foreign designs. 
World War II had seen the United States become the world's most successful aircraft manufacturing nation, and the US had some difficulty in accepting a foreign design for evaluation. But they seriously studied two. First was the Canadian CF-100. This was more truly a twin-engined fighter, but was ultimately unable to carry a worthwhile payload. During World War II, the British had also studied the area between fighter and bomber, and the remarkable de Havilland Mosquito, very fast and agile, had been produced. After the war, the RAF had sought a jet-powered replacement for the Mosquito, acknowledging the need for such an aircraft. The English Electric Company had come up with the new plane, a very advanced design which was given the name Canberra. The aircraft had simple lines and combined the agility and speed of a fighter with the lifting power of a bomber. Right from the very start, the Canberras were a success, and production orders for the RAF were so large that much of the production was subcontracted to other aircraft manufacturers. The classically streamlined Canberras, robustly designed and with their powerful Avon engines, were a formula for success. However, interest from the United States was initially muted. There had never been a true equivalent American type to the Mosquito either. But in view of the Korean experience, interest grew considerably because the English Electric Company's aircraft offered a proven successful design that could do the job and would be available for early delivery if the war dragged on. Given Martin Marietta's interest in the B-51, it was that company which was awarded the contract and was duly licensed by the original designers to produce the aircraft. In March 1951, after a record-breaking transatlantic flight, the first of the Patton aircraft landed in Baltimore. A sleek spectacle for the crowd who had gathered to see it. since the DH-4 of World War I had manufacture of a foreign plane even been contemplated, and now it was happening. With the Canberra to come into production, the gap in the US inventory would be plugged. It wasn't to see service in Korea, but was to prove its worth in combat and the wisdom of its purchase many years later.
contract confirmed that the Martin Company would continue to build bombers at its Baltimore plant for at least some time to come. In the post-war years, in the absence of military orders, Martin had diversified with some early success into domestic airliner manufacture. However, much hinged upon the government requirement for the high-speed, lightweight bomber. The first Patton aircraft crashed, killing the navigator, and it was left to the second British model to continue much of the testing. The American version of the Canberra would soon be on the production line, but there were still many problems to be solved in making the transition from British to American standards. Even simple basics like the size of the thread on nuts and bolts differed in the two countries. And there were many more technical alterations. It was to be over two years before the top brass would be able to assemble to inspect the first machine off the Baltimore production line. aircraft appeared, they were externally almost identical to their British cousins. Perhaps the major initial technical differences were Martin's incorporation of the B-51 advanced rotary bomb bay and the replacement of the Avons with Sapphire engines. The engines of the Canberra were started with a cartridge and this produced a characteristic cloud of thick black smoke. Though US engineers worked on improving the starters, there was always a notable exhaust when the plane started up, a displeasing trait in an otherwise tidy aeroplane. see the prototype's pitot tube, packed with sensors to gather test information. Generally, the first A models differed little from their UK counterparts, although this was to change in a short time. Under the bubble canopy sat the pilot, and behind and below him was the navigator's station. The navigator doubled as bomber and had to transfer between his normal position and the perspex nose cone when acting in that role. surface of the wing, you can see the small slats which act as wing air brakes for the bomber, again identical to the British variant. As the early B-57s went into service, many of them had received the black non-reflecting paint that had been developed for the P-61 night fighter a simple but effective anti-searchlight technology. Much of the original US purchase justification was based on the Canberra's potential in nighttime operations, and many were utilized in that way. While 171 of the A model were built, it was acknowledged that there were flaws with the plane, some considerably more serious than the black smoke of the starter cartridge. Most important was the position of the second crew member as the US moved to turn the plane further from a light bomber towards its interdiction capability.
the B-57B was soon introduced, bringing with it clear external differences from the British plane. Behind the wing, air brakes, similar to those introduced on the B-51, were installed. These were also being more widely adopted by other jet designs. A tandem crew arrangement had been arrived at, with both crew members housed under a canopy with excellent visibility. The placing of the two crewmen on the aircraft's centre line in the elongated cockpit gave the B model more of the feel of a fighter. It also allowed the use of conventional ejector seats for both crew members, although considerable testing was needed to sort out the best arrangements before the modifications were carried through. The mock-ups and dummies graphically illustrate the immense pressures involved. And, adding the factor of aircraft speed to what you see here, you will appreciate just how dangerous a process ejection can be for a crewman. The most minor failure in design or manufacture of any component in such a system could be fatal. Another change was to the cartridge system and its housing, though the black smoke continued to be part of the process. Despite training, it is recorded that new ground staff occasionally panicked at the smoke from ignition and doused the plane with flame suppression foam, to the discomfort and annoyance of the crew if the canopy was open at the time. The B-57B also had much increased firepower and options. There was an emphasis on interdiction, with facility for air-to-ground rockets as well as an immense selection of general purpose and specialist bombs to be carried in the bomb bay. Despite some continued reservation about the plane, the B-57 was shaping up outstandingly. It had high speed and the ability to reach a very high altitude. In addition, it had maneuverability similar to a large fighter and the ruggedness and sweet controllability to be used at low level in ground-hugging attack in the way of the old Douglas Invader. What had been an outstanding design to start with was becoming, with these refinements, a truly great plane. And the Defence Department, understandably, persevered with the aircraft's evolution. One of the Canberra's virtues was its relatively short landing and takeoff. However, landing with one engine out could be risky, 
and result in the write-off of the plane. Here you can see the large ground-to-air unguided rockets, which coupled with the new wing-mounted machine guns or cannons to give the B-57 more of the forward punch of a fighter. The UK Canberras were never fitted with wing-mounted guns, but for the B-57's interdiction role, both the cannon and the rockets were vital. The concerns of the designers are exhibited in the bomb bay. The installation was arranged so that the whole bomb bay floor, preloaded with bombs, could simply be swapped over at the end of a raid, so that the plane could quickly be turned round and sent back to the battlefield. Given the proximity of some forward airfields to the front, this would mean a great saving in the average time involved in each sortie. also seen as a place to mount a battery of downward firing machine guns in large packs to simply saturate the ground beneath with a heavy rain of bullets. had become outstandingly versatile in both senses, outstanding in the number of roles it could fill and outstanding in how well it did them. The plane was very robustly designed with a lighter servicing requirement than other planes of the time. Perhaps a little ignominiously, one of the roles that they were purposely adapted to perform was that of target tow, admittedly a useful task. Painted bright orange, to hopefully minimise the chance of being mistaken for the target, 
the E model was equipped with powered cable drums in the bomb bay to trail large fabric targets from canisters in the tail section. The targets, understandably disposable, were used in training fighter pilots. Furled much the same way as a flag, they were installed in the plane. Certainly not the most glamorous of jobs. Nonetheless, this required a certain fatalistic courage from the pilot. Still another kind of courage was needed by pilots of the then secret spy planes. The Air Force had committed itself to the Lockheed U-2 and set great store in its value. With its enormously elongated wing, the U-2 was virtually a jet-assisted glider with the ability to carry highly sensitive reconnaissance equipment to a height considered to be beyond the reach of Soviet missiles. A product of Lockheed's legendary Kelly Johnson, the U-2 was, for a long time, a closely guarded secret. Its mission was to fly Soviet airspace during the sensitive years of the Cold War. But the Lockheed plane was late in production. The combining of so much new technology was to take far longer than had been envisaged, though the end product was to be an outstanding success. In the interim, there was a major perceived need with no plane to fill it. shrouded by secrecy, the role of the U-2 is now well known. But less so is the fact that Martin engineers worked against time to convert the standard Canberra to an ultra-high altitude capability with massive wings. such a grossly extended wing, problems of metal stress and fatigue became central concerns. But even while the engineers continued to work on the problems, the Air Force, eager to commence activity, accepted the first RB-57D with some modifications still to be made after the aircraft went into service. For years to come, improvements were still being worked on to perfect the massive wing structure for lifting the Canberra beyond the supposed reach of missiles. You can see here how the modified wings behaved, drooping and flexing under their own weight. These single-seat spy planes performed a valuable, if unpublicized, service. While they did not have the overall refinement of the U-2s, they had a greater lifting capacity and could carry a large payload of either photographic or electronic reconnaissance equipment.
The standard camera's wing assembly was so sound that they provided years of fatigue-free service. The spy plane's wings, however, had a very limited lifespan and needed regular rebuilding. regularly made unobtrusive, extremely high-altitude flights over Soviet territory, with their high-technology black boxes installed behind the pilot and silently gathering information. For these probing scans of the Soviet defences, pilots were carefully selected and inducted. The usual mission saw a climb to around 60,000 feet just prior to entering enemy airspace, and the pilot proceeded using a specially built mechanism to scan below the plane to see where he was. At that height, his forward view was of a very distant curve of horizon. The whole concept of high-flying aerial spying was still in its infancy when the RB-57 first came into production. Even the testing equipment seems primitive by today's standards. But given the breakdown of relations between the two post-war superpowers, the technology applied to this reconnaissance work was the pinnacle of that available at the time. perspective on the achievement the RB-57s represent, one must only consider that the B-29 bomber, operating at 30,000 feet in the latter stages of World War II, was all but out of reach of the Japanese defences. And yet, under a decade later, the Canberras were comfortably maintaining a height twice that of the superfortresses for much longer periods. progressed, the massive wings had to be constantly maintained and rebuilt to ensure that these unique Canberras stayed serviceable for as long as possible. Ultimately, fatigue took its toll and they were replaced, in some cases by the U-2. However, remarkably, years later, other Canberras were taken out of mothballs and modified with an even larger wing as the RB-57F. This aircraft with fan jet engines supplemented by two additional turbojets, used a wing almost twice as large as the already massive fixture of the earlier Spy Canberras. The RB-57F was ostensibly for weather reconnaissance, but there is little doubt that it was also used in clandestine operations and in monitoring work related to the atomic bomb test series. Although it is known that the Soviets succeeded in bringing down U-2s, there is no record of either of the two remarkable big-wing Canberra models being lost in action. Enemy fire did take its toll of the conventional B-57s when they were deployed to their original combat duty in the skies over Vietnam. By 1954, 
20 B-57s were based at Bien Hoa, near Saigon. From here, they were to be used in the low-altitude ground attack for which they had been prepared. Too late for the Korean conflict that had defined their role, they were a most timely presence in Vietnam. Although by now they were over 10 years old, the strength of their airframes and the common sense of the basic design still held them in good stead over enemy forces. They were normally used south of the border in what theoretically was South Vietnamese territory. Often working in close cooperation with forward ground control, Canberras would respond via a sophisticated control network. Light aircraft were used to first locate the targets, then mark them with signal rockets so that the Canberras could home in with precision attack. There is no doubting the value and effect of the presence of the B-57s in the American air war over Vietnam. They were a massive attribute. The Canberra's luck was not always in. On Halloween night during their first year in Vietnam, their base at Bien Hoa was attacked by Viet Cong insurgents. The closely parked Canberras presented an easy target to the guerrillas, and during the evening, mortar fire devastated the entire base, destroying or badly damaging 20 B-57s, along with other aircraft parked on the crowded tarmac. These losses had to be made good with aircraft transferred back into service from the air guard after updating. But none were as advanced as the ultra high technology G model, which drew on the experience of the now venerable B-26 invaders, which in their third war had been used in nighttime attack in Vietnam. The Air Force employed a few Canberras to test new technology in night sight television. The aim was to identify and disrupt nighttime Viet Cong activity along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And in 1969, 16 B models were returned to the Baltimore factory for modification. The Canberras, designed in the 40s, modified during the 50s, in service in the 60s, now found themselves state of the art in the 70s. The large modified nose housed the new see at night technology. And curiously enough, though the installation lowered the top speed, it enhanced the overall stability of the plane. Only one of the 57 Gs was lost. And generally speaking, the project was a success and provided air crew with a facility that they had never enjoyed before.
providing these innovations was high, both in installation and maintenance, and eventually, as with all Canberras, the G models were withdrawn from service, although the technology that it pioneered was to be used in other specialist aircraft, like the C-130 ground attack gunships. devastating success and came as a fitting culmination to the overall B-57 project. The decision to break with the American design's only tradition had been a bold, if not controversial, step. It was a matter of necessity to fill a vacuum as fast as possible that forced the Air Force to acquire what was undoubtedly the best available aircraft for the job. But it is equally true to say that the modifications identified and perfected by Martin and the Air Force made the B-57 a very different plane in the long run from its British and Commonwealth equivalents. The basic airframe carried those modifications into use in a way that makes the family of Canberra's deserving of the title Great Plane. <laughs> 